Chapter Development LLC. The total annexation area is approximately 29 acres. The proposed annexation area is contiguous to the town's primary boundary in that it is a, across the right of way of US Highway 17 from existing town corporate limits. On June 16th of this year, the applicant submitted a um, voluntary annexation petition and an annexation and zoning application. On June 20th of this year, council directed the town clerk to investigate the petition and on July 18th, the council accepted a certificate of sufficiency. The subject parcels are shown in red in the center of the screen towards the top consists of six parcels totaling approximately 29 acres. Across Highway 17 is the Hawthorne Waterside project that was recently annexed into the town earlier this year. Other areas in yellow are also under the town's jurisdiction, uh, including Brunswick Forest, as well as Planters Walk, uh, Snee Farm, and Stony Creek to the southwest of the subject site. This is a proposed recombination plat that would shows um, the recombination of those six parcels into two parcels, including a residential tract of approximately 19 acres and a commercial tract of just under 10 acres along the frontage of US Highway 17. As a summary of the statutory authority for the town, North Carolina General Statute 160A 31A provides that the council may annex by ordinance any area contiguous to its boundaries upon presentation to the council a petition signed by all owners of the real property located within such area. General statute 160A-31A uh, also requires that the public hearing be properly noticed. This hearing was properly noticed in the Wilmington Star News on July 29th and August 5th of this year as well as adjacent uh, property owner notifications mailed to the property owners adjacent to the property. The Brunswick Regional Water and Sewer District has agreed to provide water, sewer, water service to the annexation area and the town would provide sanitary sewer service to the annexation area. It's worth noting that upon annexation, police protection, fire protection, public streets, and sewer maintenance would be provided on substantially the same basis and, and in the same manner as such services provided within the rest of the town of Leland. As part of the annexation request, the, application, the applicant is requesting vested rights based on a preliminary county approved development plan that I will go over in the future. The development plan shows 123 units uh, townhome development on approximately 19 acres uh, located on the more rearward portion of the track. The remainder of the annexation area, the commercial portion, would all be subject to review by the Town of Leland and subject to the Town of Leland's planning and zoning policies and regulations. We do find that the annexation proposal is consistent with the town's master plan in these five areas. Um, in summary, Action items A3, A7, A9, A21, and A26. The town sector map identifies the property in the intended growth sector, and the 2011 CAMO suitability map identifies the property as most suitable and somewhat suitable for development. Staff recommends approval of the ordinance annexing the properties into the town of Leland and suggests the following motion. Motion to adopt ordinance 019031. I'd be glad anybody. to address any questions you may have. Hey, anybody got any questions? I just had one. The uh, contiguousness is based upon the relationship with Hawthorne. Is that's that correct? That's correct. Anyone else? Hearing none, I'm going to close the public hearing and call for a motion. Motion to adopt the ordinance 019-031. Second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. I'll now open public hearing. Ibis Development Initial Zoning. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is a public hearing to consider initially zoning the properties subject to the annexation of the previous public hearing. The parcel is identified by the parcel numbers on the screen in front of you. Again, we're talking about six pieces of property located off of U.S. Highway 17, totaling approximately 29 acres. Again, this is across from Hawthorne Waterside, recently annexed into the town of Leland. Background, again, the applicant is Buster Development, LLC. The zoning map amendment is in connection with the voluntary annexation that you just considered of nearly 29 acres adjacent to existing uh, town limits. In June 16th of this year, the applicant submitted a uh, voluntary annexation petition and an annexation and zoning application. On June 20th, council directed the town clerk to investigate the petition. July 18th, council accepted a certificate of sufficiency. On July 23rd of this year, the planning board unanimously recommended to council to initially zone the annexation area as R6 medium density as well as C1 commercial business district. Present zoning of the property of the parcels petition uh, for the annexation are commercial low density, which is a Brunswick County zoning district. <clears throat> to the north is SBR 6000, which is high density site built residential, again, a Brunswick County zoning district. To the south across Highway 17 is Leland Multifamily District. That's the Hawthorne at Waterside project. Additionally, Leland Plan Unit Development and C2 zoning, which comprises portions of Brunswick Forest. And to the east and west of the subject site is Brunswick County Commercial Low Density. Here's a map showing all of which I just explained. The areas in the peach color are the Brunswick County commercial uh, low density. The areas in blue are Brunswick County site built residential 6,000, SBR 6,000. Across Highway 17 in the green is Hawthorne Waterside that is zoned multifamily under the town of Leland's jurisdiction. And the mustard color is Brunswick Forest, which is both PUD and uh, just off the screen is a portion of C2. Pro proposed annexation area, excuse me, the proposed zoning area is outlined in the red on the slide here. The proposed zoning for the subject site includes R6 medium density. It will be developed under the performance standards. In addition, the out parcels along the frontage along US Highway 17 would be zoned C1 which is the town's general commercial business district. The town's R6 medium density residential district with the performance standards is suitable for single family dwellings and townhomes. Commer commercial and industrial uses are not permitted. Density can be up to seven, seven units an acre versus the 13.6 units an acre allowed by the county's commercial low density district. Total allowable units at seven units an acre on the 19.191 acres would be 134 units. The allowable units under the county's zoning would be 261. This slide shows what the zoning districts would look like if the requested zoning was applied on the 19.191 acre residential tract that would be the R6 under the town's jurisdiction and the purple along US Highway 17 would be zoned C1 comprising nine point, approximately 9.8 acres. R6 provides for paved roads, curb and gutter, public water, public sewer, underground utilities and street lights. R6 developments typically contain open areas available to all residents within the subdivision. Property owners in R6 are typically members of a homeowners association and the minimum size for a subdivision for performance standards must be five acres. 
for the C1 General Commercial Business District that is suitable for retail and commercial uses and the clustering of small businesses. Single family homes are a permitted use, however, industrial uses are not permitted. Apartments and townhomes are also not permitted, and the minimum lot size would be 6,000 square feet. The applicant is requesting vested rights based on a plan that was approved by the county in October of last year. That development plan shows 123 units, which is less than the maximum allowable density of 134 that would be allowed under the town's R6 zoning. The setbacks are very similar, 20 versus 25 in the town's R6, 10 in the county versus seven and a half in the town's R6, and then the rear would be the same at 10 feet. The developer would need to submit final plans to the town to assure conformance with that plan that was approved by the county. The property itself, only a portion of it is within a special flood hazard area as shown by the slide here. <clears throat> the areas in orange and yellow are both considered the 100 year flood areas. The proposed development is well outside of any of these areas. We were not able to find any history of any flooding or other environmental concerns on this site. This is a copy of the development plan that was approved by the county in October of last year. Again, this comprises, uh, is comprised of 123 townhome units. There would be two egress points off of US Highway 17. In the center of the screen, uh, towards the bottom is a, a hatched area that is not included in the annexation and, and is not included in the zoning application here. This is, that would remain under the county's jurisdiction. That is a single family uh, home. It's our understanding that they are aware of the development that is being proposed as well as the annexation and the initial zoning hearings tonight. All of the townhomes are well outside of any special flood hazard area. Any of the development of the out parcels shown along the bottom of the screen would be subject to review by the town of Leland. And they would need to conform with the town's planning and zoning policies and regulations. Staff and the planning board found this proposal to be consistent with the master plan in these five areas. These are action items from the master plan, action item A3, A7, A9, A21, and A26. The town's sector map identifies the subject site as intended growth sector and the 2011 CAMO suitability map identifies the subject site as most suitable and somewhat suitable for development. At their July 23rd meeting, the planning board voted unanimously to recommend approval of the initial zoning, finding that it is consistent with the objectives and policies of the plans adopted by the town of Leland because the proposed zoning would promote a diverse range of afford affordable housing ownership and building types, and that it is reasonable and in the public interest because the proposed zoning will support expansion of the town's tax base while ensuring public health, safety, and welfare. Staff recommends approval and suggests the following motion as shown on the screen in front of you. That concludes my presentation. Glad to answer any questions. Anybody? None. No one? No. Okay, hearing none, I'll <coughs> close the public hearing and call for a motion. Motion to approve ordinance 019-030, affirming the planning board statements that the amendment is consistent with the town's adopted land use plans and is reasonable and in the public interest. Second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. 
Motion carries. Now I'll open public hearing up its development economic development agreement. Thank you. This is item 12 of public hearing to consider a development and economic development agreement with Buster Development LLC. <clears throat> this is in connection with the annexation that you considered uh, on your agenda this evening and approved. Again, as a reminder, tonight staff presented to council the ordinances to annex and initially zone the six parcels, totaling just shy of 29 acres. Both of those ordinances were approved tonight. Here are the six parcels, totaling nearly 29 acres. This is a subdivision plat showing a recombination of those six parcels into two parcels, a 19 plus acre parcel for residential development and a nearly 10 acre parcel for commercial development. Again, total annexation area was 28.972 acres. North Carolina General Statute 160A-400.22 provides that local governments are authorized to enter into a development agreements upon approval by the governing body. And the North Carolina General Statutes also provide that each city is authorized to make appropriations for economic development purposes. Those appropriations must be determined by the governing board to increase the population, the taxable property, agricultural industries, employment, industrial output, or business prospects of the city <coughs> or county. Those appropriations may be funded by the levy of property taxes and by the allocation of other revenues whose use is not, not otherwise restricted by law. This public hearing was properly advertised as required by the general statutes. It was advertised in the Star News. Some projection of the economic, de uh, economic benefits to the town. The development of the subject site is anticipated to generate $92,672 per year in ad valorem tax revenue. And that is based on the estimated value of the completion of the residential development and the commercial development of the 29 acres. The projected sales tax revenue is based on the 123 unit townhome development averaging two persons per unit at 246 people. Take those 246 people and multiply them by $24,317 per 100 people. And that's about $60,000 per year projected sales tax revenue. The projected total projected tax revenue upon full build out is approximately $152,700. A year. Sorry, per, per year. year, excuse me. This is a table that I will go through. <clears throat> the first row is the projected sales tax revenue for each fiscal year beginning this fiscal year and increasing um, up to 60,000 in fiscal year 22-23 through fiscal year 28-29. <coughs> the projected property tax revenue is anticipated to increase up to $92,672 per fiscal year starting in fiscal year 22-23 all the way up to fiscal year 28-29. When you add those two together, we get the annual revenue that is projected, which <coughs> climbs up to $152,672 per fiscal year, beginning in fiscal year 22-23. 
based on the sewer infrastructure in the residential portion of the development, the approximate annual sewer operation and maintenance costs are approximately $31,000 at the time of completion and acceptance to the town. We would increase that by 3% per year. If we take the annual revenue that is projected on the third <coughs> row and take that difference between that and the approximate annual operation and maintenance costs of that sewer infrastructure, uh, that is the total figure in the net annual revenue row. The cumulative revenue, which is the uh, each year's each fiscal year's revenue added up as time goes on, that's projected to be one million one hundred ninety thousand five hundred thirty-two dollars by fiscal year twenty-eight twenty-nine. The cumulative approximate annual sewer operation and maintenance costs are based on the annual approximate annual sewer operation and maintenance costs and added up as time goes on over the years projected on this table. So the net cumulative revenue by fiscal year 28-29 is projected to be $835,152. And again, that net cumulative revenue is taking into consideration the operation and maintenance costs for sewer infrastructure that the town is anticipated to take acceptance of. The development agreement imposes a lump sum payment of $400,000 to the developer. That payment would be made from system development fee money in the utility fund. That is different from taxes collected in the general fund. So system development fee money is not tax payer money. It's money that's collected, paid by developers to the town uh, for the cost of development of utility infrastructure. So again, that $400,000 is proposed to be taken from that utility fund, the system development fee money from the utility fund. In return, the developer would pay for the on-site and off-site sewer infrastructure, and the town would make that payment, lump sum payment, one time of $400,000 <coughs> when the town accepts the sewer infrastructure. I'm going to return to the previous slide for just a moment just to point out that the net cumulative revenue would exceed $400,000 by fiscal year 25-26. In addition to the tax revenue that would be realized by this development, the estimated sewer system development fee money that would be paid to the town for the residential development is projected to be $611,000. Additional sewer system devel development fee money would be paid to the town for each of the out parcels as they were developed with commercial buildings. That fee would be based on what type of use it was, so we're not able to project those until we know what is being proposed to be built on those out parcels. But in general, those appropriations would increase the population, taxable property, employment, and the business prospects of the, t of the town. That concludes my presentation. Staff recommends approval and suggests the motion on your screen. Glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, can you back up to the chart with all those big numbers on it? There you go. So, just point of clarification: property tax revenue is based on the current tax rate, correct? That is correct. Okay. So, as that rate changes, the revenue would change. 
That's correct. It's also based on the current value as well. Right. Okay. Uh, can you explain um, where am I at here? The annual revenue seems to go up until 23, 24, and then it starts to decline <clears throat> and 24, 25 and on through. Can you, can you clarify that? The property would go up in value to that point and then would reach its peak. And so until it was reevaluated, that number would remain the same. I, I believe the decrease that you're referring to is indexed to as these improvements age the cost to maintain them rises slightly is that what you were asking about okay, yes so. okay. okay. if you'll look at the so is the annual uh, maintenance cost uh, go up the revenues right go down yeah the farther you get away from construction the mm. the more it costs to maintain so that number goes up and that would explain the decrease correspondingly to the in the net annual revenue Okay. Anyone else? Just a note on that: the maintenance, the money to that, w that is required to maintain that infrastructure would come from the utility fund, so it doesn't come from tax money. Other question? Mike. When do the system development fees get paid? The six hundred and eleven thousand dollars is that based on each sale of each house, or does that happen before we start selling houses? That happens at the time that uh, prior to building permits being issued. So it happens as those are or being each home. So Correct. it's very incremental. Yes. When it comes back, okay. Could could be. Could be. Yeah. I mean, townhomes still. They have a the developer has an economy of scale to get right. all the permits. It's not like single family. Well, if they could do fifty at a time. Right. Yeah. Which is a quicker turnaround of paying the the system development fee. Right. Okay. Y'all make sure you speak into the, to the mics for the tape. Okay, anyone else? <clears throat> okay, no one else. I'll close the public hearing and call for a motion. Motion to adopt ordinance 019-019032. Second. Okay, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. I'm now an open public hearing coalition of wireless facilities. Thank you again. This is a public hearing to consider a staff initiated text amendment to amend the town's code of ordinances to accommodate for co-location of wire wireless facilities in certain zoning districts. Again, this is a staff initiated text amendment, so the town is the applicant. This proposed amendment would allow co-location of wireless facilities in virtually all of the town zoning districts by right. Currently, they're only allowed in C1, C2, and C3, which are, are our commercial districts, office and institutional, and the conservation district. We began exploring this amendment in discussion with the possibility of co-locating on water towers in the town's jurisdiction. Some of one of them in the plan unit development district. Here are some examples of wireless facility co-location. We see two water towers here on the screen. The difference between those, the one on the left shows co-location. Those antennas actually on the top of the structure. The water tower on the right shows the antennas on the uh, catwalk, I believe is the non-technical term. And then in the center is a typical monopole style tower uh, with a co-location, <clears throat> essentially uh, accommodating a second wireless provider on that same tower. So each of these are examples of uh, co-location. What's being proposed, um, let me back up. You may recall uh, earlier this year, very early this year, you um, approved a text amendment 
that established regulations for wireless telecommunication facilities as part of that text amendment co-locations was grouped into this row in the table of permitted uses in the town's code of ordinances what we are proposing is to remove co-locations from that row and establish it as its own use in the table and allow it by right in each of these zoning districts the intent here is to minimize the need for new wireless communications towers if there's an existing structure that's out there that can support the weight of the uh, the uh, antennas and uh, any other um, features that need to be added for co-location we want to encourage that versus require or versus the need for a new monopole or whatever style tower at their meeting last month the planning board unanim unanimously recommended approval of this text amendment as part of the motion they added this statement into uh, note nine um, which basically says that any kind of antennas or equipment should be as stealth as possible they shall blend into the supporting structure to the maximum extent practicable staff and the planning board found this to be consistent with the master plan specifically action item a3 to develop and redevelop land through coordinated system of neighborhoods <coughs> districts and corridors the planning board voted unanim unanimously <coughs> to recommend approval of this finding that it was consistent with the objectives and policies of the plans adopted by the town because of the amendment would allow for utilization of existing structures to support co-location of wireless facilities and they also found it to be reasonable and in the public interest because the proposed amendment would minimize the need for new wireless telecommunication support structures staff recommend recommends approval and suggests the following motion I did want to add one additional note that any time uh, co-location would be proposed on an existing structure as part of the permitting process a structural analysis would be required and so at that time the engineer that would provide that uh, application to the town would need to demonstrate that it meets any wind loading requirements typically of 140 to 150 miles per hour so that is part of the building code be glad to answer any questions Paul is there anything in the ordinance at this time that regulates the number of wireless uh, connections on a single location there's not anything in the ordinance that limits the number there is a clause in the ordinance that says if you build a tower over 50 feet tall that you have to design it to accommodate at least one other provider so mm -hmm. again that's a way to encourage or uh, almost require co-location but there's no there's no limit on if a tower provider wanted to design mm -hmm. a tower to accommodate 10 structures they could be able to do that or 10 providers what happens if a company puts a tower on there and they go out of business or something like that, emerge with someone else? Is their responsibility taking it down? Typically, they would take their equipment down and, and sell it or sell it to another provider. Mm -hmm. If they were bought by another company, that company would just continue to use that equipment. Right. Typically, as part of a lease arrangement with an existing structure, that's, that's, there's an arrangement in there for a cessation of use type clause. Good thing. Anyone else? All right, I'll close the public hearing and call for a motion. Motion to approve affirmative planning board statements that the amendment is consistent with the town's adopted land use plans and is reasonable and in the public interest. Second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. I'll now open public hearing planning and building inspections department. Are you ever going to sit down? <laughs> this is my last one. I promise. I'm tired of hearing myself talk. Um, this is a, another staff initiated text amendment for your consideration tonight. This is to uh, amend the code of ordinances to reflect some recent organizational change as planning and inspections is now is now its own department. We would like to add to the code of ordinances uh, the ability to do um, planning efforts for the town so in the town's code of ordinances we have uh, chapter 2 article 3 which sets out uh, 
the planning functions um, for different entities within the town. This is from that particular section which lists the designated planning agencies, Town Council, Planning Board, Economic and Community Development Department, and the Board of Adjustment. We'd like to add the Planning and Inspections Department to this list. Also within that article are brief descriptions of uh, different departments and entities on that list on the previous slide. We're proposing a, a brief summary of the function of the Planning and Inspections Department which includes the Planning and Inspections Divisions, Code Enforcement, and we would support the Planning Board, the Town Council, and other town departments in developing and facilitating plans, policies, and regulations for the physical, economic, and social development of the town. This is intentionally somewhat vague. At their meeting last month, the Planning Board unanimously voted to recommend approval of this amendment, finding it to be consistent with the plans adopted by the town because it would establish the function of the planning and inspections department and also reasonable and in the public interest because it reflects recent change in departmental organization for the town. We do recommend approval and suggest the following motion. Glad to answer any questions. Thank you. No one? Wow. Mm -hmm. I'm All sorry. Right. <laughs> I'll close the public hearing and call for a motion. Make a motion to approve affirming the planning board statements that the amendment in consistence with the town's adopted land use plans and is reasonable in the public interest. Second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Thank you. Okay, now I'll open public hearing ground signs in the T5 zoning district. Ashley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I was actually going to let Ben do this one too, <laughs> but here I am. So, um, so the text amendment before you tonight uh, was submitted by Harrington Village and Logan Holmes as the applicant. Um, a little bit of background on this. When the town adopted the flex code, um, it was always the intention to go back and develop a sign ordinance that would better match the type of development that's allowed by right in the flex code. Um, currently, the flex code uses the existing sign ordinance. So um, this is a step in the right direction, um, in staff's opinion, towards building a sign ordinance that will better complement the form-based code. So the language before you tonight will create a couple of definitions to clarify terms that have been included in the proposed language. It's going to establish regulations pertaining to the type of developments that are qualifiers mm. for this language, establish a couple of type of ground signs, and create requirements for those ground signs. Here's some of the definitions. Um, the language is included in your agenda packet, the first one being a development identification sign. This is um, typically a larger type sign that identifies a larger type of mixed use development than the gooseneck lamp. Um, those light fixtures hanging down over the top of the ground sign. Ground sign, just a standard term that we need to provide some clarification in the ordinance. Halo lighting, this is a type of lighting that's external, but it's backlit for the sign, creates a halo effect around the sign copy. And multi-tenant development, this is very similar to the current definition for combined development in our existing sign ordinance. It's been modified just a little bit uh, for the flex code. It contains two or more uses and shares common facilities such as parking, driveways. It has covenants such as like a business owners association or property owners association that governs more than just the signage and it's also designed and planned in a cohesive manner. The proposed language, uh, these types of signs being proposed would be available to qualifying multi-use tenant developments within the T5 zoning district. This is a map that shows you where our T5 zoning district is located here in town. Let's see if I can pull up, if I can remember how to pull up the, uh, oh, there it is. 
So this is um, Village Road here. And this is the front of Harrington Development here. Um, this would again apply to multi-tenant developments that have at least 24,000 square feet of non-residential use and also have an entrance on Village Road. There are a couple of developments there off Village Road that would qualify for that now. One of those being Harrington. The other would be the shopping center where the laundromat is located. Um, there are two types of ground signs again proposed here. Those multi-tenant development ground signs which are very similar to a combined development sign and also the development identification sign. Some of the regulations for the multi-tenant development ground sign, they need to be compatible with the surrounding character and changeable copy is not permitted on those signs, so the sign copy has to be permanent. The sign has to be attached to a continuous pedestal, for example, like the one you can see here at the bottom. So no space in between on posts or poles. And that pedestal can exceed two feet in height. That height is included in the overall allowed height of the sign. It's very similar to our existing sign ordinance. And individual businesses within a multi-tenant development are not permitted to have individual business ground signs. Some location requirements. If a new multi-tenant development ground sign is proposed on a parcel where a sign is already existing, a ground sign is already existing, those signs have to be at least 50 feet away from one another. And if the new proposed sign um, is going on a property where there is a ground sign on an adjacent parcel it has to be 200 feet away from the existing sign. Can't be located in the right of way. Town maintained easements or site distance triangles. Those, that's pretty standard language that we see for all ground signs. And the sign can't encroach elements of the public frontage. And basically what that means is it can't encroach areas where there's a planter strip for trees and street lighting. It can't be in the sidewalk area. It does have to be surrounded by low-growing plant materials. The picture on the screen now is an example of what it could possibly look like. For illumination, they are allowed to do internal illumination on these signs. The background of the sign cabinet has to be opaque and only the sign copy can be illuminated. The alternative version of that that we're used to seeing um, is where the entire sign cabinet is, lo is illuminated. They're also allowed to utilize external illumination. They can do that through using a shaded floodlight, a gooseneck lamp like we saw in those definition pictures, or halo lighting. The sign on the screen is using the halo lighting up here at the top and then also a shaded floodlight that's shining up from below. These next elements also pertain to illumination. They're pretty standard, has to do with not creating a nuisance for adjacent properties and not impairing driver's vision. So flashing lights aren't prohibited and that light source does have to be shielded from the public view. For their entrance on Village Road, they would be permitted a sign that could be up to seven feet tall and 10 feet wide. So they are allowed to play around with those elements a little bit in terms of how they get to the total allowable 48 square feet allowed. And then if they have a secondary frontage, so it's a corner type of development where they ha are also fronting on another street other than Village Road, they're allowed a secondary multi-tenant development ground sign. That uh, sign is just a little bit smaller, so the maximum height and width being 5 feet and the total, total overall size of the sign copy can be 25 square feet. Moving on to the development identification sign, a lot of these uh, requirements are very similar to the multi-tenant development ground sign. Compatible with surrounding character and no changeable copy. Also attached to that continuous pedestal. The distance requirements from existing ground signs change just a little bit only where that's, uh, the, the proposed sign is located on a parcel that's adjacent to where an existing ground sign is located. That comes down to 75 feet. The reason for that is the elements in the flex code uh, require much more narrow lots. So we adjusted that here so that it would make a little bit more sense. 
location um, requirements still the same for right of way and easements, site distance triangles, and the public frontage elements, and also landscaping. The illumination for these signs, they can utilize external illumination only through those same three means, shaded floodlight, gooseneck lamp, or halo lighting. There's some examples there on the screen for you. These elements are the same. Still not creating a nuisance to the adjoining properties or tenants and not impairing a driver's vision. A couple of different things are being measured here for height, width, and, and um, overall area. So the, the overall structure itself, um, the maximum height is five feet and the maximum width is 55 feet. Those are the um, measurements of the existing Harrington square sign that you see in the picture. The sign copy size, so the actual height of the sign copy area not exceeding two and a half feet tall with a width of 25 feet and that total square footage area is 36. They can have one of these on Village Road and they can also put one on a secondary frontage if they're a corner type of development. That secondary sign can be half the size of the primary sign on Village Road. Um, after reviewing the language that was submitted by the applicant, staff took a look at our master plan. There's three action items here on the screen for you that show the consistency with that master plan. So tying the zoning directly to our sector map and requiring context sensitive design. And so basically what that means is still paying attention to um, the priority in that district being the pedestrian, but also catering to the vehicle in some manner encouraging a high quality of life and walkable neighborhoods. During their July meeting, the planning board reviewed this and voted unanimously to recommend approval to the council tonight with the reasons that are listed on your screen. And staff is recommending approval and suggest the following motion that's on your screen. I'd be happy to answer any questions, and the applicant does have a representative here if you have any questions. We'll try to get those answered for you. I got a question for staff. Um, with the recent change of the signs that have been replaced and all, would this have helped any of them in any other way that we did not work with them on? It wouldn't. Actually, these signs are much smaller than what they were allowed to install. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, I was just worried about that. Anybody else got anything? No. no. Okay, hearing none, I'll close the public hearing and call for a motion. Motion to approve the Farming Planning Board statements that the amendment is consistent with the town's adopted land use plans, is reasonable and in the public interest. And again, this is uh, ordinance 019-034. Second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Okay, I'll open public here and accessory structures and uses. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, tonight I'll be presenting the um, a proposed town um, town staff uh, text amendment excuse me uh, for accessory structures and uses a little background on this text amendment our current um, code of ordinances currently does not uh, dif differentiate between accessory uses and accessory structures or accessory structures to accessory buildings in doing so uh, town staff is proposing the following changes in regards to adding modifying and removing definition of the zoning ordinance and already established and regulated uses to the permitted use table. Create consistency in regulations of placement of accessory structures and add additional structures and provide criteria to accessory structures that, not require, that do not require zoning approval section. So in the following slides, I'm gonna summarize kind of what's in your memo packet in regards to the language. Um, our first section is going to be our definition section 66-4. Uh, we broken down to those definitions that would not that would be removed, be added and modified. Um, the ones that are being removed have the parentheses in regards to why uh, those are being removed. 
the definitions that be added are are already being regulated, but not been defined in our definition section of the zoning ordinance. And then the definitions that be modified, just trying to clarify and so in that language. Um, again, accessory structure um, has been kind of been brought against accessory building, accessory structure, so we're trying to clarify that. Moving forward into the next section that's being modified is section 66162, the permitted use table. Uh, we're here, we're adding the reference sections and where you find the regulations for accessory apartments, whether it be attached or detached. And we're also adding where the permitted uses are for the accessory apartment attached. These are already currently the zones that are permitted. They're just in the verbiage, in the, in the language of the regulations and not within the permitted use. So we're just trying to clarify that information. And those regulations that are already installed are going to be added to this section for note 28, which we'll go over later. And of course, we're removing a garage apartment as well, uh, which will be regulated as an accessory apartment attached. So again, I mentioned before that the current zoning ordinance doesn't differentiate between accessory uses and accessory structure. So in this section, um, 6622A, we're removing the structure regulations and just focusing on the structural uses. Um, as you can see, uh, the current language um, has a language and all, uh, has the structure language and also has setback language that would be printed to a structure or building. As soon as you add a building or structure to an accessory use, it creates itself to be an accessory use, an accessory building or structure. So to have regulations for an accessory use uh, with setback businesses doesn't quite make sense. So moving forward to the accessory structures, we've kind of blended the accessory structure language and accessory building language that's already currently in the, the code of ordinances to try to find the best practice and you know not creating nonconformities already in the town. So again, we've mentioned before, there's uh, the current ordinance contains setback and location regulations, difference between those, those two. I've already mentioned about the accessory use. As soon as you add a structure or building to it, it would create itself to be an accessory structure. And the proposed language is that combination, as I just mentioned. So some of the items that are being regulated currently and we're continuing to regulate, we're just going to have that one line of accessory building and accessory structure out, will be known as accessory structure. So, for example, the first line there is the number of accessories our current accessory structure regula regulations <laughs> will allow four on lots greater than one acre, where accessory building regulations will allow four on lots four acres or larger. Um, since there's only going to be one terminology for structure and building, we're choosing the proposed regulation, what we think is the best fit for the town, and proposing it to have four accessory structures on lots greater than one acre. Similar aspects regarding height. In regards to setbacks, uh, it'll be this very similar aspect. I'll point this one out as well, where we had specific language in regarding how far a setback can be for accessory structure, which would be 10 feet from the side or rear, or five from specific zoning districts. Then in accessory building structure, you can actually have a structure three feet to the lot line, which again kind of contradicts between the two so we kind of did a blend of the two took the accessory structures that could be five feet as long as there's a fence between there if they're less than 10 feet from the side line, from the side setback or rear for that matter and again we also regulate lot coverage uh, in regards to a percentage based upon the primary structure of that lot versus how many um, accessory structures are going to cover the rear or side lots, uh, so rear or side yards, excuse me. Again, all those right, uh, definitions are in your memo packet. We've also added additional language to the same subsection. Uh, accessory structures are to be located on the side or rear of the principal structure and not extend beyond the frontage of the primary. Separate, the separation between structures uh, will need to be met by the current code of the state building code, since current version of the state building code. 
and statutory structures shall not be placed in town maintained easements, utility easements, drainage easements, or right of way. The next modification is going to be accessory apartments attached. As I mentioned before, we've moved this language under the area and yard requirements for primary structures under note 28. If you begin adding onto a primary structure, you're pretty much doing a structural improvement and would have to follow the same setbacks and regulations as a primary home. Um, so we've had added language, um, same language that's currently in our ordinance, but have differentiate that zoning approval is needed in regards to if they want to have an accessory apartment attached home operating out, out of their primary structure. The next subsection is accessory apartments detach. Um, again, there's not really any change in the zoning districts. Um, however, we did make a note that the lot must, primary use must be residential and not commercial. Maintain the same lot size regulations, but replace the gross total enclosed heated square footage measurement with a quantitative of lot coverage. The lot and setback distance are the same, including those structures located on corner lots. In added language, that fence is required as setback is less than 10 feet from the property line. And that's consistent with an accessory structures that I previously mentioned. Our next subsection is swimming pools. Uh, we clarify language in the location of pools and primary um, residence for interior and corner lots. There's no changes to the proposed pool setbacks and maintain the same minimum distance from the lot line. Uh, currently and continually being proposed will be 10 feet from the rear, 5 feet from the side. And just to make note, at one point it was proposed to have a 5 feet from that rear setback, but planning board encouraged to keep that 10 feet. And, in that, and there's no fencing requirement other than that meet the most recent version of the state building code. And that's currently the same thing right now as well. We removed language, uh, reciting the state building code fence requirement. This is something that's reviewed um, at a certificate of occupancy for a pool. So our built state, or I'm sorry, our town building inspectors look for the fencing that's required at the time of CO. And we clarify which type of decking is counted towards the lot coverage. Finally, for the, for the section of accessory structures not require zoning approval, um, these items are still obligated to meet the general regulations of all accessory structures, unless stated <coughs> otherwise. They still must meet the uh, state building code, and such structures may still have to t obtain other permits uh, beyond the town if necessary. So some of the things that were not being changed in this section is the language for temporary ported, portable storage units. Uh, we're not changing the language for fences and walls. We're just relocating it into this section. It was in a different portion of the, of the town's ordinance. And currently, uh, upturn features will continue to be allowed to be placed on lots without zoning approval. We're just removing that term, but those items that were considered that um, could still be approved without zoning approval with other regulations. We are making some additional proposed items for this section as well at grade covered on covered patios, portable fire pits, outdoor fireplaces, children's play sets, and ADA accessible ramps to single family or manufactured homes. Those regulations were also placed in your memo. We do find this as consistent, part of our master plan, as it should simplify the application process. On the July 23rd planning board meeting, um, the board voted 7-0 to recommend an approval of the text amendment with the reasons stated below. And the staff recommends approval and should us the following motion that's on your screen. And that concludes the presentation and I'll take any questions. Mike. I just want to clarify, are lots adjacent to alleys or pathways considered a corner lot? And has come we, up. Just, we just we just changed that language. I'm try, trying to re reflect. Give me one moment, real quick. Okay. So the corner lots we just were not changed and are not considered corner lots anymore. According to say that again. I'm sorry. Lots on alleys 
that alleys are not considered core lots sure. with, with the base change that happened to about two months ago. Okay. I knew we had done that, but I just couldn't remember what we decided. I, I, had, I had to remember as well. So. <laughs> okay. I have a question. Uh, so a fire pit doesn't fall under this um, amendment, but um, does it have to... Uh, in order to have a fire pit, are you have under some sort of fire code regulations? There, there are building and fire code regulations to fire pits. Um, there are items regarding um, open flames. There's also a regulation in the building code that, that need to be a certain feet. I believe it's 25 of, um, in regards to that. Uh, this language is still part of the ordinance, so it is supposed to be followed in regards to any type of installation of these items. Um, of course, if there was any type of trades, let's say it was a gas fire pit, that would all that would definitely need a building permit, uh, nonetheless. So, an individual who wants to have a fire pit needs to contact the fire department to have it checked out as being installed properly and located. And they would have to measure off at least 25 feet from their home. Right. And there's also language regarding open burning. And you can't have open burning air, um, you know, within a town jurisdiction up to a certain point. I think it's a diameter, but I'm not positive on the, the fire pit language in regards to the fire department code. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking of the fire that we had at Mallory Creek Plantation caused by a fire pit. Mm -hmm. so. But exactly, and that's, I think that's one reason why the 25 foot, you know, distance requirement is required. But that doesn't apply to the ones that, like you go buy one. The definition is portable fire pit. So, you know, it, it, mm -hmm. that could, anything that's gonna be open burning, they should be placing it 25 feet away from the, the structure. Okay. Anyone else? No. Okay, I'll close the public hearing and call for a motion. Motion to approve, affirming planning board statements that the amendment is consistent with the town's adopted land use plans and is reasonable and in the public interest. Second. That's ordinance 019, or rather 019033. Second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. Board committee appointments. Uh, everyone has your ballots. Ballots, and does, have, has everybody filled theirs out? Okay, I need to remind everyone that the third person on your in your package for the Parts and Rec Board does not live in the town. So I just want to make everybody aware of that. So Are you saying they're disqualified? Yeah, not to be on our board, they have to live in the town. Who is going to be on the WMPO bike pet committee? So we'll collect these and get them to Mr. Hollis and Clark. It happens. I mean, sorry about that. Need some Jeopardy music to play. Good job. <laughs> well, while they're doing that, I'll say you can tell staff has been working hard. Pretty, very hard.
Okay, um, Madam Mayor, it looks like uh, the vote tally has Michael Long uh, appointed to Parks and Rec, uh, Thomas Gorner uh, appointed to Planning, and William Ryder for Infrastructure. So if you could make a motion, uh, have a motion made for those appointments. Does anyone want to make a motion? Ask a question before sure. we do that. What was the outcome on the uh, infrastructure committee? So it's three for Ryder and two for Tragorth. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we need a motion on this. Uh, Madam Mayor, uh, move that we uh, accept the uh, appointments of Michael Long, Thomas Corner, and uh, William Ryder uh, to the appropriate. Uh, uh, committee and board positions. Second. Okay. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Discussion topics. Mr. Hollis, 18.1, League of Women Voters. Yes, ma'am, Madam Mayor, Council. Uh, we had a request. Uh, from the League of Women Voters to have a um, candidate forum here at the town hall. And we wanted to pass that on to council and let council decide if that's what you want to do. Um, they request for it to be the end of September, September 30th. Questions or anything? Do they have a time? I think it's 6 p.m. That's when it normally is, Mike. And that's to use the chambers here. Yes, ma'am. We would house it here in the chambers if that's appropriate. If council uh, approves that. Well, I think we kind of set a a um, annual uh, event by by hosting it here. And given the fact that it's it's so difficult to um, have a way for our people to actually hear the candidates who are running mm -hmm. and and make a more informed decision, I I, I think we're doing a, a really valuable civic service. So I I would say we should do it. Okay. Do we need a motion or? Do I would say if. I would say as long as it's open to all candidates. Uh, yeah, just like, yeah. Oh, it would have to be. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I just want to clarify that. I think a simple consensus would work for us. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Everybody okay with that? Good. Yep. All right. Thank you. We'll let them know. Okay. Now we have 18.2, water sewer. Yes, please. Madam Mayor and, and Council, I'm going to uh, step down and recuse myself uh, during this topic. Okay. Do, just, do we need to motion or just let you do it? No. I'm not voting, so I was just letting you know. Okay. I wasn't just walking away. All right. <laughs> Get. Get. <laughs> and, and the reason uh, Mr. Reese is doing that because uh, it's what I want to talk to you about is a part of the uh, settlement agreements that we're working on. Uh, regarding the uh, sanitary district and town of Belleville litigation. Um, and as you know, um, Mr. Wessel continues to represent the town in this matter. <clears throat> so uh, in an effort to be as transparent as we can, as we can uh, we've had a lot of negotiations uh, regarding uh, this, this matter. And uh, to the extent that we could, we have been fairly transparent with some of the positions that we've taken uh, without destroying, you know, our, um, 
uh, without destroying the process and we're without destroying our position. Um, so there's been a lot of proposals out there. Um, uh, the town of Leland has uh, taken a, a few different stances and a lot of that is to vet out uh, different positions that the different entities have. Um, but it was effective. We got everyone to the table uh, and we have a possible proposal uh, solution here. Um, what I'll try to present to you uh, here and to the public is the basics of it. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do and a lot of details to work out, uh, but I think it's important for us to provide as much information as we can uh, to, to you and to the public uh, as appropriate. <clears throat> so um, there, there's been a, a lot of talk and uh, discussion um, amongst the community of this litigation uh, and where Leland's position is and has been. Um, you know, some claim that, you know, our objective was to take over the sanitary district uh, and, you know, that's not true. I think what we were truly looking for is a partner, an ally uh, in growth and development in the region and I think this proposal will give us an opportunity to, to have that. Um, in general, uh, I'll go through some points here of the uh, of the a possible settlement. Uh, again, this, uh, this is the basics and it will take a lot of work to get the details hammered out. <clears throat> the primary uh, point is that a settlement will end the litigation that has been going, going for quite some time uh, in the appeals and uh, the, ex the expense that is being incurred by uh, the public funds uh, that are being used to for this litigation. Now, I do not want to diminish the litigation at all uh, because it is uh, was important uh, and it was effective. Uh, it, uh, we through that litigation, we were able to show that uh, certain actions um, are not permitted by public entities, uh, and with that uh, knowledge in hand, we're able to then move forward into uh, these settlement negotiations. Um, the, um, another point of the settlement uh, agreement and this proposal that uh, we're putting forward and that the, the parties have uh, looked at in principle right now is that the assets uh, that were illegally transferred uh, from the sanitary district to the town of Belleville will be returned to the sanitary district and they will have the ability to operate the, that system and use those assets as they see fit. Um, and essentially uh, re-empower the sanitary district uh, for the entity that they are. Um, the town of Leland uh, effort in this, uh, we are looking at conveying all of our utility assets uh, to the sanitary district. And that's no, uh, no item to be taken lightly. Uh, we are proposing to transfer about $16 million uh, in cash uh, and about $50 million in assets. So you're looking at about $66 million of value that the town of Leland possesses right now that we would convey over uh, to the sanitary district. <clears throat> and we would allow the sanitary district to operate that system. So they will operate all of the system as one system. And there's a, a lot of inf uh, efficiencies to be gained there, um, both administratively, operationally, uh, and physically with the assets in the ground. <clears throat> and there's an, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> there's a, an economy of scale to, um, to be gained there as well. Um, the, um, 
And, and with economies of scale come uh, a lot of things, uh, the potential for uh, a larger customer base, um, better rates, uh, better distri distribution of uh, financial resources. <clears throat> in addition, it would allow the, the town to grow in cooperation and simultaneous with the sanitary district as, as it grows. So the town would have an ownership claim in the assets uh, within the town and within the town's uh, possible future expansion area. <clears throat> so uh, that is the benefit to the, uh, the town of Leland. Um, it's again, we're, we're no longer in a competition with the sanitary district to provide water and sewer as uh, services to areas. Uh, we're in a partnership essentially with them uh, as the region grows. Uh, it brings a lot of stability um, to the area. Uh, it eliminates a lot of confusion uh, in water and sewer providers. Uh, currently, we overlap jurisdictions uh, and there is confusion among developers, there's com confusion among uh, general customers about who's providing what uh, service. So this will help eliminate that and it'll, uh, in, a, in a bigger picture, it'll bring harmony to the region as well. Um, we are, we become allies and partners and working together uh, for the growth uh, of this area, the economic development of this area, uh, instead of uh, butting heads. So, in in general, uh, from my perspective, I think it's a, a good uh, proposal, and it's a it's a unique proposal. It's something that has come out of these negotiations, um, um, being able to see different sides uh, to everybody's interest. Um, it, uh, it, it has benefit to all parties. Uh, and that's uh, truly a negotiation that I think everyone can be proud of, is that uh, we, we've taken uh, a deep consideration of what everybody's position may be and what interests they have, and we've tried to satisfy as much as that as we can. Not everybody's getting everything they want, but everybody's getting a lot of what they wanted uh, and it um, it's a, a, a way for us to uh, uh, to move forward uh, to put the past behind us and hopefully uh, have a more uh, a peaceful region and a, a, an area where we are uh, partners and working together uh, for the benefit of all um, what I would ask of council tonight is uh, like I said, this is, uh, this is a, a high level look at a framework for a proposal. It's going to take a lot of work to get the details out. Um, what I'd like for council to consider is uh, allowing us to have our attorneys continue this process, move forward uh, with developing these agreements and uh, have an opportunity to bring that back to council, a formalized agreement uh, that the council can consider, but also the other entities uh, are, that are involved in this uh, matter can consider as well. Mike? How does this get settled in court, David? Do you take the uh, in settlement agreement to the court and ask the court to, to what? Yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll uh, take this uh, settlement to the court and ask them to approve it um, and essentially ratify it for what, uh, what we're trying to do here. Uh, and it will um, have to be taken to the court to be able to end the uh, appeals process and, and all yeah. that that is going on now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I just want to say I think this is a great first step at unifying our region.
And if I could, uh, I'd, I would like to add, I appreciate uh, all the hard work and effort that's gone into this so far to, uh, to get us to this point where uh, we essentially have a, uh, a win, win, win situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you say, can move forward. Yeah. Well, the nice thing is we will move forward whether our neighbor wants to move forward too, right? And Bell does move forward, we'll, we'll move forward. Yes, sir. Um, so again, the, the basics of the, the agreement, um, the assets are returned to the sanitary district from Belleville. Um, mm -hmm. The sanitary district operates the system. Uh, we convey our assets to the sanitary district. They operate all that as a unified system and the water treatment plant that has been proposed the aquifer-based RO plant uh, is constructed by the sanitary district. Um, and the towns have an ownership claim in assets that allows the towns to continue to grow. So for those, Madam Mayor, if I could, so for those folks that have been wanting to have RO water available, and I know you're in the initial stages of this, the RO plant that H to go would build is separate from what the county has proposed to build, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And the timelines are probably going to have to be revised since the project itself is now a year or more behind, uh, or maybe more, I'm not sure. But that that's correct too, right? Yes, sir. It'll take a little work to get the, the process back going again. Um, and there's some approvals that have to be uh, sure. obtained for the aquifer based RO plant to move forward. Um, but that process will begin again uh, and they can move forward and it may take um, 12 months, it may take 18 months for that uh, to be completed. But that's part of the agreement is that the RO plant would be constructed um, in conjunction with these other factors. Are we still gonna, is the town still liable for uh, town residents still liable for the county's water system expansion to include the RO, their RO um, system? So the way the county intends to pay for the improvements that they are making at the Northwest Water Treatment Plant is through rates. So okay. it'll be the users who pay for those, uh, those improvements. Okay, thank you. Okay, anybody else? No. Okay, you just need a consensus. Just a consensus that uh, we can have the attorneys continue in this process and work toward a formalized agreement. Is that acceptable to everyone? Okay. Yeah, I'll agree. Mr. Cameron, you have another question? Or no? no, I'm just okay. giving my approval. All right, thank you. All right. Under old and new business, staff reports are in on your iPad. So is your board committee monthly meetings, uh, monthly reports, uh, council reports. Anybody? Uh, just trying to be brief about this. Of course, we all have seen the media coverage on the um, situation with the Cape Fear Crossing project, but. I just want to clarify that until such time as the crossing is permanently or may or may not be permanently removed from the project list, it still appears uh, among the transportation projects that are unfunded. And um, it currently still has $32 million uh, in funding for right of way. so those things still appear on all these documents that we see uh, and they will continue to be there until uh, a decision is made to either remove the project completely or there's a new effort made to continue with with the project and the other thing i wanted to say is it it's a shame that the two uh, uh, events didn't get covered at the same time but <clears throat> the day after the Cape Fear Crossing or, uh, 
media coverage, uh, lo and behold, we find out that um, the NCDOT is having a very severe funding problem. Uh, they're talking about laying off hundreds of contractors and subcontractors. Um, they um, have uh, this looming uh, huge, huge uh, bill of settlement fees uh, because of the Hampstead Bypass property owners that, that entered into class action suits. Um, and they also have uh, much more uh, money that has to go out thanks to hur the hurricanes that we had. They only budgeted 50 million for those and, and they ended up spending 300 million. So they, NCDOT has one bad, bad funding problem right now. And I think we'd be crazy not to tie that with uh, pulling back on the Cape Fear Crossing. That's all I'm going to say. I just have a, a comment about that. If, 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 if that's correct, and I believe what you're saying, um, our roads and our infrastructure in Leland already need a lot of help. And we've talked over the last three years about different ways to do that. I certainly hope that um, if the DOT is in such bad shape that we will take another look at our infrastructure and see where we can make improvements that we may have to fund here in Leland, but they will be for the benefit of our folks that live here and work here and really rely on our transportation system to get around. We have got to fix some problems that we know about. No, no doubt. And I think our uh, uh, committees are working on, uh, our staff is working on a plan, land use plan, and um, thinking in terms of the future, not knowing what's going to happen to the transportation budget. I think we're going to have to look at what you're suggesting. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Pat. 19.4, event planning. <clears throat> yes, ma'am, Madam Mayor, Council. Well, we had discussed uh, at the agenda meeting uh, the possibility of having uh, two council members um, meet with staff to discuss the um, Christmas event that we have planned, uh, work out some of the possibilities and details with that, uh, make sure that we're um, uh, all uh, under the same mindset when it comes to that event. Um, so we'd like to have uh, two council members uh, allowed to meet with staff to uh, to do to do that and uh, we'll take um, suggestions on who you would like to do that if you would like to I got a lot on my plate Mike being you're the until December you're the uh, chairman of the TDA could you volunteer to be on this please I'm just asking I'm not telling I'm asking <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we're asking a lot I think we're talking about a couple of meetings where we can uh, lay out what um, what could be uh, included in a event like this sure be happy to you can count on me <laughs> yay <laughs> you'll do it you can't you want me to do it maybe okay maybe well you got your two people all right. You, can, you okay with that, Bob? Sure. Well, Bob, but you're going to do it nice up too. Go right ahead. I'll take over when you leave. You're <laughs> you're, you're busy enough as it is, I would yeah. guess. Uh, I got plenty. Yeah. Um, and if I can make a suggestion, um, uh, Mr. Beatty was here this afternoon with uh, Chris Andrews. Chris is with the cool Wilmington productions, festivals, and events. They were here and they're visually and uh, p pointing out and checking and what have you, the, the area in relation to the rice festival. Mm -hmm. Well, he has done many things, <laughs> including the St. Patrick's Day Festival and Parade. 
and he might be an excellent person to talk to mm -hmm. about helping with our parade. Here you go. Hey, maybe TDA could hire him. <laughs> okay. Enough said. <laughs> you got your two people. <laughs> Thank you. Don't forget, the Rice Festival has its own board. And that may be something that they're they're thinking about uh, with regard to the Rice Festival. So I'm glad to hear that, that, that he was here. Yeah. yeah, he was. All right. That's everything. We made it. Mr. Hollis, you told us two hours. <laughs> okay, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Next meeting date for the council's regular meeting will be held on September 19th, 2019 at 6 o'clock or shortly thereafter. Autographs, please. No.